introduction of the plant or insect that shouldn't be there when we have a drought, when we have a new infestation or something. And I have to say that Jim has the highest curiosity quotient of any biologist I've ever met. So turn it over to me. <laughs> All the things that Dave could have said, I'll, I'll pick up. But he said, I've known him for 40 years, and uh, and there's a few other things that I'm glad he didn't bring. <laughs> so tonight, I, I was asked to talk about Cal Mountain, the recreation area up on up the hill, up that way, west, uh, east of here. Um, and I just said, I said, give me a title. What, what, what are you going to talk about? Uh, I don't know, plants. Uh, there's all kinds of things to talk about there. And I thought, Started thinking about it. So, well, you know, it's really a gem, an unused gem in our backyard. It's right here, and so many people don't use it and don't even know it exists. Um, so, it, I'm glad it's not a test because everybody would be seeing the answers come. <laughs> you know, I so I guess everybody gets 100. percent So, as I run through this and get to the end. Uh, actually, as I go, go through this, if you have a question uh, along the line, yell out and or raise your hand, get somebody, and I'll try to answer it the best I can. If uh, there's a question that you think of asked afterwards, or you don't have time to, to do it, or you have to leave, or whatever, I'll have my email on there. You can email me as, as well. So, um, Count Mountain. There you go. Oh, it's not going. Yeah. Really not the idea. I know he's not the Okay, since this is the Audubon uh, co-sponsored event, I have the obligatory bird picture in here. Um, I, it will be the only one in there today. Uh, this is the, uh, the the California thrasher. The reason it's in here for, is for a couple of things. One, Dave was talking about observing. You know, you slow down, you stop, you look around, you're having lunch, you sit down, you look. You'll see things that you normally don't see. Things will come in. Sometimes it's like a thrasher landed right in front of me. It was there for 10 minutes. I didn't have one of those fancy cameras like, Days and and late on how you know those cameras with I mean those cameras with lenses on my parents. Uh, and, and sometimes uh um oh the other thing I was gonna say I was first introduced to this uh bird by Jack Booth on, on a Audubon uh bird camp. And for people who aren't in Audubon, it's an awesome way to get to know birds. It's to go out with people who are real knowledgeable, not me, a lot of people here, and uh and do the bird camp. So you get to learn stuff, you get to see cool stuff, and you actually get to help along the way. Okay, I guess I get to point to you. And it is also co-sponsored by the Sanhedrin Native Plant Society. And this is our logo. This is the Silene Hooker Eye or Hooker's Silene or Hooker's Champion. And this is a rare plant. It's up on Cow Mountain, about three or four locations. And this plant is... Um, um, we got what else I was going to say on here. Well, on that, let's move to the next one there. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Uh, see, if I had that, then I wouldn't have to be saying that. Um, this is Captain Mountain. If we see a, I still have a pointer, I think, in here working. Yeah. The, this is Captain Mountain right here, uh, the BOM lands up in here. And the, where the red is here, those are three public routes of, of entrance to the property. It's 46,000 acres, this whole parcel from here down to about right there. 
This down here is uh, Sheldon Springs area, which is accessed off of Highway 175. I mean, uh, 175, Old Toll Road. Uh, it goes up to Highway 175, but the access. Now it's working. Now it's working. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'm not applauding for Neil. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. We might just need you. Too. Okay. Uh, back to here. Now I have to watch my button. I push this thing. Um, um, here, this is the Glen Eden Trail and entrance. This is the uh, Mill Creek Road right here. And then this right here is Scotts Valley Road. Scotts Valley comes up here and then goes over here to, uh, to Mill Creek. They connect. That's the road that goes through there. There are gates on both ends, both right where the red stops on there, because they'll shut it when we, they get excess of rain. So there's people don't get stuck up there in the mud. So there's not a lot of erosion. So uh, also during fires and other things. Um, it's split into two units. So this 46,000 acre parcel is split into the north part, which is um, if I look right here, so I don't have to. Uh, have my back on everybody. You might hear me a little bit better. Uh, the north part of the Cal Mountain uh, is about 20, uh, 26,000 uh, acres up there. And what I have right here where the arrows are, this is the start of Eden Valley, uh, I mean Eden Valley, Glen Eden Trail. And there's a parking area right on Scotts Valley Road there. It's two and a half miles south of uh, um, on Scotts Valley Road south of Highway 20, just past, past Blue Lakes. And it goes all the way up to the ridge, which is right here. However, this top part up here, uh, once the fires happened in 2018, it's been obliterated. It's, it, you can't see it. And I know Andy has tried many times uh, to reconstruct where that trail is going. And, and we have found parts of it in there. And uh, hopefully that will be something that they actually will get to to reconstruct. The other one I think most people are probably familiar with the Valley View Trail that starts right there, goes up here. Um, uh, that's probably the most, it is the most uh, used trail of any of the trails up here. So there are not that many trails and that's North Cal Mountain uh, and they're all out and back trails. So the recent talking with BOM has been trying to encourage them to have some loop trails, have a number of loop trails so that people can go and come back. Because on if you take Glen Eden and you want to do a good hike, you have to park a car here, you park a vehicle up here. But that means you have to drive up here first, drop one off, drive all the way back around the highway to 101 to 20, down Scotts Valley, and then park there. Now you've got to go back to, to one person to pick it up is a long way, a lot of driving. Okay, so South Cal Mountain is 26,000 acres, 23,000 acres, something like that. And South Cal Mountain has about 91 miles of trails up here. Those trails are OHV trails. OHV is off-highway vehicle. Uh, Off-highway vehicle is pretty much what South Cal Mountain is dedicated for uh, historically in, in their use through uh, BLM. Uh, those, all those trails can be used for mountain biking. That is, I mean, the ones with, the, with pedals, not with the, with the gas. Uh, they can be used for hiking. They can be used for uh, trail running. You know, what, what those vehicles on. Most of the time, those vehicles, those off-highway vehicles are only there on the weekends and only there on the times when, like right now in the spring when it's cool, after we've had and everybody's been cooped up. And then in the fall, after the, when the first, after the first couple of rains, when it gets cool, they have to wear so much garb, protective garb, it's too hot to be out there during the summer, which is good for us, at least for me, uh, definitely. <laughs> Um, there is also was a meeting a year ago, and they're talking about putting an additional 40 miles of trail in there for OHV. And the San Hedrin chapter in the Plant Society did write a letter, and they said, Well, wait a minute, before you do put all these additional trails in, you need to start managing and repairing the trails that you have already and reroute some of those that are in going through sensitive habitats. Um, uh, this is in the, what happened after the fire. In 2018, 
when you had a, the fire went through, as a friend of mine said, uh, yeah, it just cleared all that green stuff out of the way. <laughs> and when these motorcycles just went, took off and would go everywhere that they could, and this happens to be a wet area, and there happens to be a, a, a rare plant that grows right there with this picture was. You can't see it, but it's right in that right fire, fire mark. So these things need to be blocked. It needs to be re uh, um, rerouted. Uh, that wasn't a trail. Uh, any of the fire breaks that were there became trails on that were very steep. And uh, those who have been up there have seen a lot of the erosion that has taken place. This is uh, one on Red Mountain. This is all serpentine. Serpentine is endangered or uh, a threatened habitat. There's not much of it, and it is very sensitive. Their plants don't grow much. They're, they're very short. They grow slow. And the tires on there from mostly on this is, well, it's all, this is all, this is steep. This is all um, uh, motorcycles in here. But those marks on here, those those ruts on there from, from uh, disturbed soil will stay there for years. And this, this is not a bad area. That's the only picture I could find uh, to put in here. But to the left of here, there's quite a bit of damage and over further, there's, there's a lot. And uh, cautions and whatnot. Yeah, everybody's got, you know, yes, he's common sense for wildlife for the most part. Everybody asks about, you see a lot of bears up there? No, I see some tracks. They probably smell me and go the other way. You know, rattlesnakes? Yeah, every once in a while. And every time they do see one, I think they're, I think they're pretty. I think they're beautiful. But they're... they're evil or something at the same time. But every time I see one, it just always get catching me off guard. I always jump, no matter how, how far away. <laughs> uh, but the real caution, I think, for people after hiking or doing anything up there is thinking about the heat. You get down some of those areas on the east side, especially on those canyons, uh, especially the ones that have been burnt over. There's a lot of reflection, and they can heat up real fast. you got to carry water and dress appropriately. And we forget about that because it may be a cool day when you leave, but you start getting in there and the temperature can rise uh, quite rapidly. Everybody says, well, what about the OHVs if you're on the trail and they're coming? We can hear them. That's, that's one real good thing. Uh, driving on the main road, that's probably the most dangerous as far as OHVs because you can't hear them coming around that corner. Um, I do roll down my window when I drive and drive with that. With, with, what did dad always say, Mike? Drive slow. Drive slow. Yeah. And it's really important to go on Mill Creek Road. And I've got stories for reading some of them. So um, it had to do with my truck being sized. <laughs> <laughs> so plant species, there are approximately, well, there are over 500 species listed up there. Uh, I would venture to guess there are over 600 species up there. I've got many species I have recorded that I have not added on that list. Um, why are there so many species? There's so many species because there's so many different little niches up there, so many different habitats up there. So what we're looking at here, you just you can pick out real easy three big vegetation types. We got this yellow stuff, which happens to be uh, uh, facing south and west. What happens on south and west? It's hotter, and that means it's drier. The things that plant needs that governs uh, where a plant's going to grow, how hot it is, how much sun it has, how much water it's able to get, what would the soil like? How deep is that soil? Does it have nutrients? Is it rocky? Does the, Are the nutrients good nutrients, or are they mineral toxicity? Um, Right here, we can see three different ones. This is chamois that's in flower right here. And chamois likes that hot location and also can tolerate some of the, as we'll talk about, ultramafic soils in a little bit. There's other stuff is mixed hardwoods and, and chaparral. And then we have knock home pine down here. So we have three different habitats that we can see real quick, groupings of, of, of plant types. Uh, one of the things that makes how mountain, especially Red Mountain, so unusual, rocks, tire, and serpentine. They both yield serpentine soil. For even tire, it is a precursor and a lot of serpentine, which is igneous. Serpentine is igneous. It's 30 cycles from the magnetic system. 
subjected to intensity and pressure for many years. So they will build certainty. So it's only by certainty my is stable because we got X amount of expectations that we want to see what it is. And it comes in various colors as well. Green, white, this is black. So why is certainty so important? When I said that red mountain area, or red mountain is made from the mountains in the country, it's totally certain. But that is what they call that the red mountains what they call the term a sky island. In other words, it's an island of this specialized soil. It's the normal what we call it red mountains. In California, only about one percent of the total land area is serpentine soil. One percent. But 15% of the endemic species, those are species that occur in California, but don't occur outside. 15% of those endemics occur only on serpentine soil. So serpentine soil has an overwhelming percentage of native plant growth that's only found in California. But it also has a very high uh, number of plant areas that are considered rare. It also has a very low water. It doesn't have much water. Mm, that means it's doing its job. And it's going to just make it some start sounds from some harsh environment. Come on, that is a lot. All right. It's also going to have, uh, have low organic. Well, we don't have much in the way to plant grow. You know, we get getting dead plants from the organic matter from the plant farm. And organic matter is going to feed the bacteria, feed the soil, it's going to hold water, hold nutrients. So you don't have to plant it. And we don't have much nutrients. We uh, can fertilize the bed that has an NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, or nitrogen on there. On the soils that are in the serpentine soil, it's very low. It's very impoverished soil. We also have a lot of heavy metals, nickel, uh, uh, copper, mercury, sometimes cadmium, and other things. So a lot of those things. Mineral by itself are toxic to the plants that, that would grow in the morning and try to grow on. But the big one is that thing, the MGCA. That's magnesium calcium ratio. The magnesium is super root on these soils. I have to eat magnesium. It's like a little kind of thing. So, what does that say? A lot of times, that is not a lot of plants that are growing up in the same they're going to dry up, or they're not going to get the nutrients they want, or in the case of this, they're going to be have magnesium toxicity. So, what plants can grow on? Well, we have two plants. One that can uh, tolerate both both conditions. So, like, what are they going to do? They grow on on it or on it. We got other ones that need. They need extra magnesium or ones that have adapted to it over the last million or so years. Some of the other, when you go up there, you find a lot of different rocks out there. We see this stuff kind of reminds me of that rock candy that you got in the candy store as a kid. You go in that store and mine wouldn't let you find any. Uh, I was told that recently that some of this is what they call metal liferous chirp. Most people are familiar with chirp because a lot of the points or what commonly called arrowheads are made with chirp. This doesn't break like if you know chirp has a has those conchoidal fractures, this does not happen. There's also areas like this with these the mineralized uh, springs giving uh, over the course of time wetting, depositing, drying the minerals on the soil there. And you can see the kind of the concentric rings of, of uh, years and years and years of, of uh, placement of these minerals on, on there. This is one uh, mineral spring I ran into um, you know, with, with Karen. Karen's going, yeah, we, we ran into that. And I go, wow, this looks like something out of uh, Yellowstone, except it wasn't hot. It was cool. It's a cool spring. And there's a bunch of concentric pools here. And it pulls in underneath there since it's nice. Hopefully, it is a very cool spot. Hopefully, it won't be uh, 
something you won't find in Bamalite. This is a spot that most people can hike to. This is Chalk Hill. Chalk Hill is on, I think it, it I think it's number, uh, they have all those trails numbered. I think it's trail number four. And um, uh, I, 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 Terry Heisey and myself had, uh, had a, a, a loop there where we have been going for years, kind of inventorying the plants on it. And then where is Marigold? I know she was there somewhere. And Marigold came to me one time. She said, Jim, you know, we found a plant and it looks like Tremontodendron, California flannel bush, but I don't, you know, it doesn't grow north in Napa County. Only. So she uh, brought it in. Yeah, that's what it is. And then uh, we went out there and Sure enough, that's what these plants are right here. You know, look too good right there. This is before the fire. After the fire, they got a clean slate. The trail comes below this, this chalk hill, so you can walk on that, on that trail. By the way, this is not chalk. I'm told it's magnesium bicarbonate. But no matter what, it shouldn't be walked on because it is kind of uh, fragile. This, these are uh, flannel bush. This is uh, the seeds coming up out from fire. This is the, the flower of it. Um, many people have seen that growing ornamentally around. It's a, a good native uh, to grow in the yard, but it's one to put in the background because the common name flannel bush refers to the hair that on it. Those hair can't come off and they're irritating hair that can get down your shirt, that can stick in your skin, kind of like the small cactus. Uh, when I had gone out to this parry, we were having lunch. It's again, you know, you're sitting down, you're you're resting, you're not walking. We both look over and we see some yellow in the distance. We got our, our binoculars out and we look. There's a whole creek load of these about a mile, half mile, mile from uh, that original site of Chalk Hill. We didn't go there. We haven't gone there yet because there's 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 a lot of poison out. I don't do poison. I'm going to put up with a couple of rattlesnakes and not poison them. <laughs> One of the things that you see that abnormalities that happen from the uh, from the serpentine is what we see right here. And this is this is a uh, hound's tongue, uh, common our oak woodlands. This is what it looks like around here. This is what it looks like on on serpentine. Often it'll be short. The flowers will be off color, often pink or red. We see that I see that on a lot of plants um, uh, off color. Uh, up on Rickabog Glade, there were some uh, Amanzita that has pink flowers normally, a little bit red, but they're the most intense red ever up there on Rickabog Glade. Uh, unfortunately, they're burnt in the fire and we haven't often seen since. The other thing you see a lot on, on uh, plants that grow off but may happen to be on off of uh, serpentine soils, but that happen to be on serpentine soils will be the kind of reddish purplish tinge to it. And that's simply uh, a reaction to stress because you could get that on plants from uh, other, other things. Uh, here's a uh, shady star, a normal height, about a uh, foot in height. Here's one on serpentine soil. You see my fingers, so that's, that's, what is that? You know, it's something like, you know, what's that? Inch and a half tall. A shooting star that's inch and a half tall. That's pretty small. And you notice, notice the leaves here. They look thicker and they look darker. Uh, these the soap root, sometimes called wavy soap root, wavy leaf soap root, is common all over the place, but the leaves are linear in fashion. They are not circular. This is something, it's the same species. This is just a reaction to somehow with that serpentine soil. Not just here, many places in, I've seen many places in Lake County, as well as the Sierra Nevadas. This is uh, uh, a relative of, uh, close relative of uh, miner's lettuce. And miner's lettuce, if you know, think about it, they have flat leaves and they're very succulent. That's what we call miners. We can make a salad out. They're very tender. Well, these are, are, this is very small plant and the leaves are rounded. Why are they rounded? Why aren't they flat? Well, it's a droughty soil. They're trying to reduce the surface area so they don't get hit with as much sun. They also, you notice, there's kind of a white sheen on it. And a little bit, they have a waxy white in there. The, the white reflects the sunlight, reflects the heat. The wax helps hold the, uh, protect the, uh, 
the epidermal cells, outer cells, from losing all that water to the dry air. And then we got a little cute. Oh, I wasn't going to say that. I did. Okay, I did. So what? Uh, <laughs> tell everybody. I said I called it a cute flower. It is. That monkey flower, Kellogg's monkey flower, you'll see it uh, often around. Sometimes it'll be in mass like this one here. Um, <clears throat> this is only about three inches high, but off of this on regular soil, it can be up to eight inches in height. So, you know, here again, you're seeing that. It's, uh, it also is very hairy, which helps pr uh, protect it from some of the, uh, uh, some of the heat. This is uh, a type of tar weed, also big tar weed. It's only about an inch and a half tall, but it's about eight inches wide. That's it on the left. Look at how hairy that is. And with all that pubescence that hair does, A, it shades that plant, keeps it cooler, helps it keep the, the moisture in, reflects some of uh, the heat away. And then it creates its own little atmosphere by stopping the wind and increasing the humidity next to the stomata, the little pores in the, in the leaf, and keeps it from drying out again. And we've seen some of these, these uh, 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 topics coming back and back and back uh, again and again. On the left is uh, star tulip, uh, Alicorus tony, uh, common in uh, the, the foothills with some rocky area around here, not necessarily uh, um, Serpentine, but it can be in serpentine. It's also called pussy's ear or cat's ear because of the, the hairy like uh, petals on there. This is, it, oh, guys, someone said it again. Another cute little one. Because it's small. <laughs> but right next to it, this is a four petal pussy's paw. And most people are familiar with pussy paws as a plant that grows in the Sierras or higher elevation. And their flower heads will be, oh, about two inches across, sometimes even bigger, with a bunch of small flowers. And, and they look, with all their stamens sticking out, they kind of almost seem kind of uh, soft to pokey. And this one, if you were to look at the flower, you have to look real close. So they're in, these are the seed capsules, and the flowers are, are small. This happens to be a rare plant, only found on serpentine. And I've seen it in about, about four places on, on Cal Mountain. These two are also, again, that were endemic, only found on serpentine. They're strict endemics. And this is flame ragwort right here. I like it uh, because it's one of the few orange plant flowering plants you get to see. Uh, it is uh, short. It, the flowers aren't very long live, though, unfortunately. I keep thinking, wow, I wonder how, what this would make it as an orange uh, But it doesn't. I've got a couple of plants from up there. Uh, one I'll be showing you a little bit better if you get one now. This is a uh, super leaf onion. It often grows on pure serpentine rock outcrops. It's uh, very attractive, uh, dark purple, and sometimes it'll, it'll, it'll just dot the landscape and then you'll have other plants coming up in between it. It tends to be pretty short in general. And not a short one, but kind of like uh, um, things in the desert where water is at, an, at, at, a, at a premium and plant material then becomes at a premium, they got to do things to keep all those herbivores, all those grazers and things away from them. Well, you may not see this, but if you go up there and you decide to sit down and put your hand down while you're having lunch, you'll feel those clients. This is Cleveland spine flower. And right here, and you see all those little spines on it. It has flowers, can you see it? Hard to see with the naked eye, They're only a millimeter in width. So a lot of these things, yeah, one of my friends says, you, you like all those extremal files. Is that extremal files? Because yeah, plants from little, all those extreme places, you know? I guess you're right. They're kind of cool if you're a plant nerd. And maybe you guys will think some of them cool too. This is a swamp thistle. Now I got a couple of native thistles on here because you get to see the tree view over here. Uh, native thistles, unlike all the our weedy thistles like star thistle and Italian thistle, these never become weeds around here. This is swamp thistle, it's a perennial, it needs up the, the water, swampy conditions, so to speak. Uh, that's its name. 
It's about three feet across. Kind of looks like an archer plant to me right there. And this is like felt super smooth. But if you touch the spines, like all the other spines, they're, they're quite sharp. <clears throat> this uh, brown thistle is only about five inches tall, but it makes a plate of basal leaves. They'll be from anywhere from that big to about a foot and a half wide. And what that does is keep any competition from coming up. It's shading that area, keeping the competition from coming up and also uh, holding some of the soil moisture in around uh, Israel. <laughs> the one that probably most people here are familiar with because it grows in the, on the rocky uh, uh, road cuts around here, the Venus thistle. And sometimes you can, there's one, another form of it, a variety of brother, that has uh, white flowers. But they're always on rocky uh, slope, well drained, won't ever become uh, a weed, even though they're all three of those were quite spiny plants. Rick and Bach Lane is an area that this is before the fire because the fire burned through there, but it's one of the two, three areas at least that have what are called vernal pools. And vernal pools like this. Um, have a flooded condition such that they do not, the water does not drain down, uh, does not percolate down through the ground for the soil. And vernal pools, as they dry up, they will form concentric rings around them. As, as you can kind of see right here, you see this is starting at bloom, then we have another ring right here that's starting, and then we get down to one mud. There's a lot of annuals in there. There are some perennials with a lot of annuals. They come up, do their thing quick, and then disappear. We do have plenty of perennials over here. One place I live for, for uh, three years or more. We have, you know, rushes and sedges and Eliopolis. But what's kind of cool, if you look in here, there's a couple of plants, one of them being something called coyote thistle. And they're, they, have two, they're, they have two types of leaves. When they're submerged, their leaves come out, they're kind of tubular. But as soon as they come out of the water, the leaves morph into, uh, they start producing leaves that we would call normal leaves. They're flat with lobes and spines on them. Yeah, completely different from what you would, uh, you would think. This is, like I said, before the fire. This is after the fire. This is last, uh, last January. Um, there's one of your board members right there, the Jack Boone. Brought a big old camera up to take pictures of all the waterfowl. They're not existent there. I think you guys saw one duck. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, I was off playing with the plants. Uh, there weren't any birds to look at that, 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 that particular day. Um, but this is uh, two months later, and this is a bunch of poppies and some lupin in here. And, but if you go just up from where we were, or behind where, where I'm standing, there are a lot more perennials with a lot of color in them. So the perennials, a lot more up there on the drier, a little bit drier land. And that's Maggie Arner, one of our uh, deceased <laughs> board members. See, you know, there's about four different seeing you know, species that are up there. One of them's uh, a really interesting hybrid. However, you, it's hard to find them right now. This when I was up there last uh, May, when we were up there, Maggie, looking for them because they had burned. We got to wait for them to get to some size to see them. Uh, this is the uh, way we see notice. But the thing about sea notice, why are there so many sea notice on a lot of these impoverished soils, not just serpentine, but a lot of other uh, gravelly and, and poor soils? Because they all are nitrogen fixers. Along with the uh, with the uh, lupins, they are able to take nitrogen from the air in an association with the bacteria that on their roots, and then make nitrogen. So they're able to grow where they can, where other plants can't. Remember, nitrogen is the main uh, uh, element needed for for plant growth. <clears throat> Another manzanita that is endemic on just serpentine is Jepson's manzanita. But even though, even when it's, did I say manzanita? I do have manzanita. It's not a manzanita. That's not an office staff. It's a C and office. I did that last night. It must have been doing it too late. 
Okay, that's another C note. That's the last one. C note. I could. I do have C note. This there. Okay. So how many? How many? Yeah, I do these wrong. Okay. On these, these are the seed pods, and what I put this on there is, even though they they're done flowering, they still have some attractiveness with these bright red uh, seed uh, capsules on them. And a lot of plants. This is one that I like. And it's another one that you don't want to. It's not pet friendly. You don't want to. Uh, it's fine. Keep the, the herbivores off. My favorite, personal favorite, see notice up there or in the county period, is this one here. This tobacco bush. See note this pollutinous. And it has these big panicles, sometimes, you know, that big of these white flowers. And it has these big uh, three to four inch evergreen leaves. It's really cool. And I, I had this and I always pick flowers and plant pieces and stuck them in my car. My kids would always, when they're younger, they would always say, oh, that stinks, Dad. This smells like cinnamon. <laughs> and they would always go, oh, the cinnamon plant, cool. You know? Now they, they could probably die if they heard I'm telling you the story. They're that thing. So, um, when you see, uh, Manzanita has like crystals on the leaves, and that's what it feels like. It's real rough uh, to to the touch. Again, that's to to reflect the sun and try to keep some of those uh, those predators uh, away from it. Another thing that they do, oops, we'll have a lot of this um, uh, these uh, glandular uh, hairs on there, and this Manzanita has so much. Of this gland, so that when you touch the flower, the inflorescence there, you can see how much is there. That's gotta it gotta impart something to something trying to chew it, because they're often uh, uh, pungent as well. The, man, the manzanita on the right, this is hoary manzanita. It's also very fuzzy and white in color, but fuzzy leaves. Uh, at least now through early summer. This one here has pink flowers. It's probably the prettiest manzanita that we have locally. It is available in trade. And Christine, if somebody came to you, do you guys all know Christine over here from the West Virginia Nursery? If, if somebody came to you and said, hey, can you order some of these? Are you able to do that? Or if you don't, then you can send them somewhere else, right? Yeah, well, there's, there's either, I think, well, you can check with her first. And if it's strict natives, <laughs> by the way, the, the Paul has a plant sale next uh, Friday, Saturday. There's some flowers out front. And uh, Jake told me I had to put them out there. And then otherwise, I, I'm threatened of, uh, of something, I don't know, whatever Jake would do. So this is a silk tassel. It's, the thing about the silk tassel, you go, that is not very attractive right there. It's the first shrub that blooms in uh, around here. It'll bloom first of February up on the hill every year, almost like clockwork. And it is drought tolerant, easy to grow um, um, without water around, around the Cotta Valley. This one on the right, the chaparral current, is looks like the pink flowering current that is so common in trade, but this is much better for use in Ukiah because it's more drought tone. In fact, once you get that, get that established after the first year, do it with shade in the afternoon. A lot of these plants like afternoon shade and then don't water it anymore. Same without those manzanitas. You water those manzanitas that are native around here, they'll start losing branches. If they start losing a branch, pull the water off, stop watering. That's probably uh, what's happening there. Another one that is used to ornamental is the Oregon grape. Um, we, there, you can find the Oregon grape up there down in the ravines, usually near, near, near the creeks up there. It's not something I normally think about. Uh, in some of the deeper ones, I've seen um, uh, the wild ginger that typically grows down low underneath the redwoods along the coast. And the first time I saw them up there, I was just kind of, whoa, this is up here? This is way out of place. In the, in the winter, we have uh, the Indian warrior uh, that comes up, you know, late winter. It, but it's, the thing about it is a hemiparasite. 
It's, it's partially parasitic. It partially photosynthesizes. It's parasitic on the roots of, of manzanita and madrone. Mm -hmm. There are other parasitic plants. This chaparral broomrape or, or uh, cone uh, broomrape uh, looks like a pine cone. In fact, I found some one time some students. And I said, yeah, look at that. And they were talking about it. They said, what, you mean the pine cone? I said, no. And then when they saw the flowers on it, they were like, oh, wow. Wow, this is really cool. And the one on the right, Nick Green Rape, you'll see that in the Moss Valley, Rick Bond Lake. Uh, it likes those wetter soils. It also takes uh, wet, wet wood, uh, woods uh, conditions as well, you know, uh, inside a hardwood forest. Uh, one that's kind of ubiquitous around the valley, uh, another gray on the metal, the uh, uh, Foothill Pestament. Sometimes you see that kind of in different shades of blue or even pink up there. But by far, probably one of the, the ones that draw the most odds are the, are the lilies. And there are a couple places that, with the lilies. Uh, there's one place that uh, is probably the size of this, this room here, and it must have hundreds of lilies in there, of uh, these tiger lilies uh, flowering. Uh, the chaparral lily over here, another true lily, is one that start, shows itself after the fires. Otherwise, this doesn't, doesn't flower. It may be there in a vegetative st state, um, but sometimes it will still flower, but not as not like it does after fire. After fire, they get that flesh and nutrients, all the competition's cleared away, voila, they come up. The problem is then the deer see them, and the deer love, love their cats. So, uh, this is a, a, a checkered lily. It, it, it's sometimes dark in color. Sometimes it's it's uh, yellowish in color. This is another frillary. This is the scarlet frillary, and this one's only on uh, you only see it on the serpentine soils. It stands out with that bright red flower. Not a real tall plant. You know, maybe a, a foot and a half in, in height. This one here is, uh, is a little bit shorter. This is the fawn lily. These are, are a lot more common, typically on rocky uh, slopes, uh, road cuts. If you drive up uh, Mill Creek Road and then continue on what, that road all the way to Scotts Valley, there are some curves in there that will have a lot. And, and they will bloom for a long time because the ones right now are in full sun, maybe blooming, but the ones in the shade haven't even started to uh, open up yet. So you have some of that on those, on those curves if they get af uh, afternoon shade or a lot of shade, be depending on how the orientation is, they can be uh, um, flowering, uh, you know, into well into May up there. And a plant that's really in vogue right now is, as a group are the milkweeds because of the monarchs. Uh, uh, this milkweed right here. The Indian or, milk, or uh, uh, willing milkweed is uh, is probably the most drought tolerant one, even though it's not found very often in trade. And did I say probably? No, it is the most drought tolerant one that we have. We have four of them, uh, four species up there. This is narrow leaf milkweed with the uh, uh, monarch uh, larva on it. On the left is a calm one. And unlike other calm vines that usually have this kind of star thing going out, this is a serpentine calm vine, and it does not have those uh, petals sticking out. More than that, this one gets tall. This one can be a good four feet in height. And I, I gave some to uh, some people in the uh, we grew them up at school, and I gave some to the board members of the CMPS board. We gave them to another friend. Another friend told me last year, she goes, wow, they're blooming, and they keep blooming, they keep blooming. I said, yeah, they, they like water, so keep giving them water, and they will continue to bloom, because then she goes, but, but they're so short. They're only a foot and a half tall. I said, well, it takes a few years for them to build that root mass. 
Yeah, I don't know how long they're going to be. Okay. So they are, uh, you can buy little tiny plants from Annie's annuals for about $15 each. Uh, this is the pale soil tail on Royal Larkspur. Royal Larkspur is a pretty tall plant or can be tall. It can be uh, two and a half, sometimes even three feet in height. Not these though, looks like a deer family. They're all chopped off. Yeah, darn bammy. But where there's pollinators, we get predators. They're just sitting there waiting. And a lot of these crab spiders, a crab spider, you think, well, that's just a little spider. One time I was taking pictures at, uh, of a, it was on, on the Western Azalea. Uh, and it was a tiger and a butterfly. No, they were big butterflies. And I was like, wow, this is really letting me get close. It's been here for a long time. I'm looking inside of it. Then it's funny, I'll look down. There's this crab spider with his fangs in there. Of course, the thing's not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, this fly kind of looks like a little helicopter. We see it sideways. It feeds on flying insects, catches them in midair, and it'll come and land right next to you and won't move, unlike other flies. It's a predation fly. It won't bite you. But this true bug, this true bug, if you go and grab it, it could bite you. That rostrum, that little thing that it holds underneath it, it pulls out and throws it in. So, what she's doing, I don't want to say guys, it's a she. You see, she's laying eggs. Guys don't do that. Um, this is tar weeds. Tar weeds come up late in the summer, typically. That's when they're, there's most of them around, and then into the fall. That's when you see all these true bugs. One's like this, another one called ambush bugs, which has these four legs, kind of like a, like a, like a, like a praying mantis. You know? And they you look real close at them, and oh my God, this is where they get the B rated movie ideas from. <laughs> another thing up there is uh, you will see sometimes you may be fortunate to run across historical things. This was a marker, I believe, it was a marker for a um, uh, for mining queen up there. And uh, any of those things or any artifacts, they're protected by federal law. They're, if you see something that you think is cool or you want to know more about it, take a picture of it. And there's an a anthropologist that works out of, out of uh, the office here, Chris Lloyd. Ask him. Send it to him. Go down there. He's interested in that, especially he's interested if it's something he hasn't seen that, and you, can, you know where, where it is. So Back to uh, mining, this is Red Mountain from the aerial view. This is the OHV, they call it a practice area. They have these big blocks of cement that you crawl over. But these things here, this is still scars from the mining. When they mined up there, and those were surface uh, uh, blades, you know, I guess you'd call it, where they went through, and they looked or you know, different mineral types that might be there. This is something that's going to be valuable for. Uh, Town Mountain had mining on it from what I can find out, was able to find, uh, had mining up there from the late 1800s until about World War II, and then it ceased. It was never very profitable there. Um, and But the scars remain. And down here below, there's a lot of scars. Now, but that, the optimistic thing is, you go there and you still, you can find a lot of cool plants on there because the serpentine is, or proteotype, the serpentine soil is there. And they were able to exist on there. The, the, this green, which is the sergeant cypress, may not be able to grow back in there, but the other things, other things can. Fire is something that most of us know and fear that live in wildland interface areas around here. But up there, fire is something that they, all these plants have evolved with over, over you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years. We're a Mediterranean climate. We have long, dry, uh, sometimes hot periods called summers and falls, and uh, things dry out. The difference now is, is that we're getting man-made or man-caused fires as opposed to natural fires that would happen. The, the fire uh, 
uh, period from one fire to the next uh, in California Chaparral has been estimated to be between 30 and 150 years, a long time. So between 30 and 150 years, Unlike the Sierras with all the all the pines and firs, and you see the pictures and it just looks totally obliterated. This is patchy because we have varied uh, terrain, varied uh, moisture, and we have varied uh, habitats and varied types of trees. The conifers up there, those uh, knock home pines, you know, they have all those chirpings and resins and, and pitch in there. They go up like uh, Roman Canada. Gone. But they have to, they need that to regenerate. These other oaks and whatnot in here, they didn't burn. Why didn't they burn? They maybe they didn't burn because they're in areas that have more more humidity. They're in cool areas. This is on the on the east side, face the east, so it's a little bit cooler. This is on the west side of Red Mountain. It's rocky. These cypress trees, cypress are meant to go up. <laughs> cypress do not survive, and those pines do not survive a fire. They do not re-spread out. They're gone. But uh, you see, well, how do those cypress survive? Well, this is real rocky. One of the things about serpentine and peridotite, where a lot of things can't grow, fires grow, I mean, fires grow, fires uh, move very slowly there. They can't, do, they just don't rip through and engulf the whole thing, uh, which is really good for us. This is on the upper part of Red Mountain, and it did. It was, this is solid uh, uh, sergeant cypress, and it burnt it off. And notice all those cones on top. Those cones have stayed on there for decades. They don't open until they get the heat to melt the glue and scarify the seed and allow those seeds to germinate. The next year, this is what it looks like all over the place. All these seedlings of, this, of the sergeant cypress. These are seedlings of uh, white leaf manzanita, the, the Arpistapolis visca. So we see these things coming up. There are some places that had, within a, a square foot, had a hundred uh, cypress seedlings in there. A couple of years later, part of it being the drought, they thinned themselves out. They died off a whole bunch of them. But that's normal. That, that's normal. You know, they're only uh, you know less than a foot tall at that point. It's not a fire hazard then. How long will it take for them to make cones and make enough cones so that the next burning comes by? I don't know, tens of years at least. This is an ex student of mine uh, who went on the Hong Kong Medical Degree in Forestry. I kept talking about this heavy forest up there on uh, the Sergeant Cypress on, on uh, Red Mountain because I want to see it. I want to see it. So finally, one day uh, we arranged and took him up there. And he's a little bit taller than me, but you can see that those aren't very tall trees. So I went and took some uh, cross sections of some of the dead trees. I didn't cut any live ones. They're dead, they're burned. And it took me six, we call them cooking, just took, cut them across and I took it back, sanded down. And then after I lost the sanding, and then I put them on a, a flatbed scanner, scanned them, put them to the computer, and so I was able to expand it and look at the uh, the rings. This tree was about uh, just about nine feet in height. It's three and a half inches in diameter. It was 135 years old. What does that mean? Hey, you're older than me, Dennis. <laughs> Don't forget that. Okay, uh, it means had a fire. In this guy, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, it means that a fire had not gone through there in at least 135 years. These trees, along with those pines, when they come up, they form what they call even age dance. They all come up at one time because they all burn at one time. So they all come up at one time. What's scary is when you look behind here at uh, behind uh, Ukiah and look up on the hill and see all those all those knobcone pine, how they're falling over, they're dying. And you know, wait a minute. It's overdue. But we don't want to talk about that, at least I don't. Um, 
This is the year after the fire in 2019. You see all the non compliance up there, dead, standing. And these are scenes of mostly uh, C notice from up there. And remember, C notice, one of the things they do is what? They fix nitrogen. So they're adding nitrogen to the soil. They're kind of like the banding, the first ones in, helping the soil and help that improve that soil there. This over here, this not come pine again a couple of years later. I should put 2020, it's actually 2021. And we've seen manzanita growth. We see uh, a lot of other shrubs. Now, if you went through here, these are mostly laying down. We finally got rain this year. We got snow, we got big winds, and they lie, they laid down, they broke, they fell over. This is bracken fern. Well, how did bracken fern survive? It has roots and rhizomes in the ground. They're insulated. You know, that's, that's a, maybe I got a big tunnel underneath when the fire finishes. Okay. Uh, I guess plants are kind of amazing, man. They just pop up in places you never think they will. Right. <laughs> Take them over. They'll re try to reclaim them. Uh, this is uh, Whispering Belt. And I have gone out there. Uh, a few years ago, with right after the fire, with uh, the next year, with John Adelaide, and there was tens of thousands of these. We were running around looking at these. I'm going, I was trying to figure out what they were. I hadn't seen them. I was trying to I go home and finally realize what they were. Of course, I hadn't seen them because we hadn't had a fire. Whispering bells gets the name because as they dry out, these things, uh, the paper blow in the wind, they rattle a bit. I, that same year, I was out on, uh, or the next year, I was out on uh, uh, Mendocino National Forest, and I saw some swaths that were probably uh, 200 acres, just solid of this plant. And so what the big deal about that? Well, there is, remember I said, there's tens of thousands of them out there that year, and uh, 2019, 2020, I saw about a dozen. Then I saw five. Last year, I saw a few, and it's just on disturbed soil. Disturbed soil can get huge uh, uh, some plants in the area. These plants are out there. That's the, their job. They come out, they pollinate, they get a lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of stuff going. They set seed, drop the seed. Now we got this layer of stuff that's going to protect the soil from rain and give the new seeds of another plant a little bit of shelter from that. From that uh, Onslaught of that sun. Uh, this is uh, uh, the daughter. Daughter, I, I never knew daughter did the same thing. We found fields of daughter, uh, not just like you see on the hillside, but you know, uh, 25 acre spots of daughter. Uh, and daughter is one that does the same thing. Daughter is a, par a parasitic plant, so it comes in and sinks its stuff into anything that's green and growing. But the one I find most interesting to me is this yellow up here, and this is this is all cypress, the dead stuff. Why is that yellow there? The yellow is something called bush poppy. Bush poppy was never seen, never documented up there. I know Vishnu can't tell me. I think I remember seeing one here or or there a couple of years ago, and something that that year in 2020, and there were probably there was probably 2,000 acres worth of it. It's a beautiful plant, a great landscape plant. It grows that big, but now they're starting to die out. Why were they dying out now? Because the competition's coming up and starting going to start to shade them out. So they're the first ones out there doing their job. So you kind of have a natural cycle of some of these things. Hopefully we'll have some more of these sticking around because they have uh, yellow poppy-like flowers that are quite attractive and um, this is the Cenothus seedlings, kind of like the Cypress seedlings. Scads of them. What do they, what do, they do? They're adding nitrogen to the ground, prepping it for something else. But this man's need is different from the other ones we have. This one has a burrow. It's the only one that has a burrow in our area. This is uh, Eastwood man's need. Eastwood is named after Alice Eastwood. Eastwood and some guy named Wills Jepson, that Jepson Manual, Native Plant Manual is named after, the Jepson Herbarium, and a, and a guy named James McMurphy, uh, Tracy, a couple others. They're back, uh, plant people back in the turn of the century, that is 1900, not 2000, 1900, 120 plus years ago. They were up there botanizing the, this area. 
they knew that it was a neat area, a unique area and something that should be looked at. So where, how do they get up there? We drive up there and we complain. It takes me 20 minutes to get up that road. Oh, that road had a dip in there. You know, it took me another couple of minutes. It took me an hour to get way down the far end. Imagine these guys, they didn't have paved roads. They didn't have dirt roads. They didn't have cars. They went up there with a mule and a pack and they did it. They had to be hardy people. They were up there for you know, weeks at a time. That but this one uh, will, the, the cool thing about this, it'll come up real quick because of all the root, all that root system down there has all that stored energy and can feed those new sprouts. Just like the oaks, the manzanita, toyon, um, that's the manzanita? No, this is the only manzanita does that, madrone does that. A lot of the hardwood species will do that if they are not burnt too severely. This is the one conifer that we have up there that will re-sprout. One of the very few conifers, period, that will re-sprout. We got redwood on the coast that re-sprouts. This also re-sprouts. This is you, I mean, uh, nutmeg, California nutmeg. This is the first year. Look at the poison oak. Poison oak, we all know that. That stuff grows fast, right? Yeah, that's still about five inches tall. Look how tall this stuff is. It's because this stuff has a roots to feed off of the, of the uh, old parent tree. This is about a month and a half ago in Blood Eden Trail, and they're about four and a half feet in height, and that's snow there. That's why we postpone that fight. <clears throat> Ground rose, the same thing. Beautiful rose uh, when you see it, but it doesn't necessarily bloom until after a fire. It gives it that flesh and nutrients. And I'm just gonna flip through some of these. Uh, there's a study going on right now with this up here, having to do with why some have seeds and other ones are, are do not have seeds. There's, there's clones, areas that have clones, and they're trying to figure out the, you know, the stuff on that. So I'll leave that down. California poppy, more uh, tiger lilies, uh, when the buck leaves, the nice show, which will stay this color all through the summer and sometimes into the fall. Uh, a lot of monkey flowers, or many species of monkey flower out there, are uh, uh, stream orchid, which also grows uh, commonly on the Eel River out of Potter Valley. Uh, one of where did you go? Yeah, back right down down below uh, your place where uh, Audrey's place was. Lots of it down there. Really cool plant. Uh, again, silver lupin and our our plant that we have. Um, here. Any questions? <laughs> Sometimes it's cold at this, not always. <laughs> no questions? Oh, okay. From the road. Okay. Um, if you probably don't have a floor when you drive or a high care box. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can drive that road. I would wait till probably the first of May. There will be rock on our There will be rock. It's about 2,000 feet, 3,300 feet. They stay on the main road. So during the week, do not go on the weekend. Otherwise, you'll call me up and press me out. Yes, yes. And you take your time going up the old weekend. And then for some of I read something I never heard of. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, there's a well, one of the things that the, the media loves to blow stuff up. Super bloom, super bloom. California has super blooms over seven years, but it'll be here. From there, from there. This year, Fair Valley is supposed to be good, but I just learned that there wasn't much happening yet. Yeah. Um, if the best place I've seen recently was Highway 20, east of Lucerne, that rock face is gorgeous. However, uh, you know, driving, don't end up in the way. <laughs> you had your hand up? Well, oh, very good. Carl Purdy, well, he's probably had a still up there, didn't he? Um, he, he had a nursery up there. So he would uh, have people collect different bulbs 
uh, geophytes, bulb, bulbous plants, and he would propagate them up there in these beds. When he got the, because a bulb, when they grow, they'll have the little bulbless offsets on there. And so he would take those, propagate those, build up enough of them and sell them to the city or to other places, you know, people or people back east. And I think he actually sold some stuff over to Europe as well. On the good side, the real good side, he brought a lot of attention to, wow, the stuff that the diversity of stuff up here. Yeah. It is. Okay. A few years. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there are some areas in Bear Valley that had a lot of those uh, the other, uh, last week also. But that, oh, absolutely. That's a two hour drive over there. Yeah. Yeah, no, they're, they're natural. They're California poppies, and there's a facilia, I think it's a Pennsylvania. The lacy leaf uh, facilia, which is the blue one that you go see in there. Yeah, fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I go through there and I didn't stop. I was tired. It's five o'clock at night, and the lighting was perfect on there. And those poppies react to that sunlight, they open up. I drove all my way. I kind of just drove. What's that? Yeah, I was going to go there with a friend from Humble, and he uh, he comes and said, "Now there's been a bunch of yahoos over there, and they're first they started imposing fees on people." And then I think they've done that in a number of places. And that's the media. The media hypes it up so everybody goes and anyway, you know how that goes. Uh, Mountain Hats can be really good. I haven't been down there since uh, the first of March. So is it starting? Okay. I can access talk now. Good question. When you go go up Mill Creek Road, there is that first staging area. You go past that staging area, and you can go right to uh, to uh, Red Mountain, or all the way to uh, Scotts Valley uh, and Lakewood, or you can have a beautiful drive to Keyboard. You go to what is called uh, Oak, Oak Springs uh, staging area. And I think that is, if I remember right, the trail that you start, have to go from trail two to trail four. If you get the map from BLM or you look online, you can see it and they have Chalk Hill marked on it. Okay. Yeah. And if you have uh, knee problems at all, bring a, bring a walking stick because there is one incline there that, that's steep. And it's not just a steep, it's that, you know, it's hard and then it's rounded. That's the biggest problem going down the lane, eating from the top of the ridge going down is it's a fire road and it, it you can slip side and you can get down real fast. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, we went uh was it? Two weeks ago? Two weeks ago we went. Did we see anything interesting? We saw we saw a lot of drizzle that day. Uh, we, we saw a couple of uh, farmers. They're just they're just starting, they're just they're probably full bloom right now. But that's uh, we went about my half up there. We didn't go very far uh, with the group that we had. Um was there anything else you remember? But just, just oh, the chaparral, the chaparral the, the turn. Oh. Yeah, that was fun. Still, and that's been that flowers for a long period of time. Better? Okay.